book of Hebrews chapter number 10 with me this morning, please. Hebrews chapter 10. Folks, you'll find me studying the Word of God. The book of Hebrews is a rich book, believe me. Hebrews chapter number 10. And verse number 26. For if we sin willfully after that we've received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people, note carefully, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Amen. Father, bless this holy book now. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Folks, when you come to the house of God and I get up and preach here like this, we're dealing with high things. This is not a circus and this is not a bingo parlor and this is not some ball game or some passing fleeting thing. We're talking about eternal things in here this morning that have to do with where and what you're going to be forever. And the scripture here in the book of Hebrews, of course the whole Bible for that matter, all 66 books, is devoted to one subject and that's God. And it's also devoted to a sub-subject or a sub-theme of that, and that's God's relationship with man. For God made man for a purpose. We have our animal creation. They're all here. We appreciate them, so forth and so on. But no animal rises to the height of the image of God. Man does. No animal, no animal is loved like God loves a man. Nowhere, nowhere to be found. But here in the book of Hebrews, he deals with some heavy subjects. And I want to call your attention to verse number 26 of Hebrews chapter number 10, where he said, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. And I've heard, dear brethren, good people, get up and say, Well, you see there, that once you're saved, once you're born again, that if you sin willfully, that there's no forgiveness for you anywhere to be found in the Word of God. And of course, what then does that lead to? If there is no forgiveness, that means you're finished. And then God takes you from this world. And then, of course, they get into the argument, well, what is willful sin? And on and on and on it goes. Well, folks, that has nothing to do with the text. The text is saying this. If we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth. That's the key to this verse. And as a matter of fact, that's the key to a vast majority of the book of Hebrews. For the first chapter in the book of Hebrews has to do with the very essence of the substance of God who is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so therefore the book of Hebrews begins to develop the idea that the Lord Jesus Christ is infinitely above the Aaronic priesthood and any ministry that was here on this earth of the blood of bulls and goats and so forth and so on. The book of Hebrews leads you through and leads you along in a very important subject in the Bible. And that subject is the subject of faith. For the Bible says, without faith it is impossible to please him. So we lead up to the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews because he lays the foundation for you and wants you to be ready for what follows. Look at the Bible, look at chapter number 10 and verse number 38. Hebrews 10, 38. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Therefore, if he refuses and turns away from the light and the knowledge of God that has been given to him. Then in verse number 39, the scripture says, But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Nothing could be any clearer than that. So when the scripture says that God requires faith, for the just shall live by faith, he defines it for you in the 11th chapter of Hebrews. He doesn't leave you out here uh, lurching in the dark or trying to figure out what faith is or what he's talking about in the scripture. He gives you a whole chapter that deals specifically with the issue of faith. Chapter number 11 of the book of Hebrews in verse 1 says, Faith is the substance 
of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The Apostle Paul says, we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are not seen are eternal, and the things which are seen are temporal. So therefore we have eternal vision. We're able to look past the physical and the temporary and look off into the presence of Almighty God. If the day ever comes in your life when you are far, far, far more concerned with eternity and being able to see into the presence of God than you are in this passing, fleeting world, then my friend, that's a mark and an evidence that you're beginning to mature. Here in Hebrews chapter number 11, he said, and he defines it. Verse 2, he said, for by the elders obtained a good report. And then follows the list. Of all of the people of God that had served and worked for the Lord. In other words, this is a manifestation of faith. Now we've got to deal with what we see, what we understand, what we know. Problem with man, he's, an, he's a creature of sight. He's a creature of, 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 of interaction. He, he has to, he, God's got to raise you up to where you see as God sees. He's got to raise you up from this world to, to understand as God understands. And, and once you begin to cross a threshold, then you understand the Bible definition of what a fool is. A fool can have a PhD. He can be a member of Mensa. He can have an IQ of over 200. But he doesn't see as God sees. He mocks at sin. He mocks at eternal things. He has no place for that in his life. He's a fool. And if you want to read about the fool, go to the book of Proverbs. And there's an awful lot said about the fool in the book of Proverbs. So we read here some manifestations of it. Like chapter number 11 and verse number 4, we have faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Abel knew that it was a blood sacrifice that was necessary. Don't ever let any liberal commentary tell you that there was a difference in what Cain offered. No, let me tell you something. Abel offered blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. He learned his lesson early. In chapter number 11 and verse number 5, By faith Enoch was translated, Should not see death because God transferred this testimony. He pleased God. Amen. So faith pleases Him. You see, He said, without faith it is impossible to please God. Your good works, your intentions, your ability, your talent, uh, your, your, your notoriety, uh, your position in your church and your hierarchy and all of that, that doesn't please God. What pleases God is what any simple person, anybody, any of us can have. And that is faith. So the Bible says in chapter number 11 and verse number 7, Faith, Noah built an ark. Chapter number 11 and verse number 8, we read how Abraham left his home. Notice how that these all are action things. These are things that a person does. These are things that show that they believe God and they're following in the knowledge they have. All of them didn't have the same light. All of them didn't come from the same place. All of them were not in the same station in life. But they had one thing in common. They believed in God. They trusted the Lord. And because of that, it caused them to do something. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 11, we read this. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. If you can take your mind back now to 1900 BC and to a woman when the angels appeared to Abraham and said at this time your wife is going to bear a son and you can go back to where she mocked and she made fun of that and said there's no way in the world this could happen. Well physically there wasn't. But faith doesn't operate on the physical limited realm. Faith operates on a much higher realm than what you can see and do and feel and hear when you rise up in faith. And so I can imagine and Sarah in that tent and her soul began to grieve and her, and her conscience was smitten and she probably buried her face in the dirt and she said Lord God he said I'm going to have a child how in the world can I have a child but if he said it so be it and then she began to conceive and she bore a son his name was Isaac amen so we read how that Sarah by first she uh, was full of unbelief and then she passed the test and she bore a child. Chapter number 11 and verse 21 by faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed 
both the sons of Joseph. Jacob started out as a usurper. He started out as a flim flam man. He started out as a, as a, as a, as a carnival barker. He started out as a crook that he would take what he wanted. But then he came face to face with the Almighty at Peniel and things changed for Jacob. And because of that, he went from the usurper to the blesser. Now some of you can't bless anybody. Some of you in this house today, all you can do is curse, blaspheme. And you're full of griping, complaining, everything that happens, you're a victim. And you can never see any light in anything. And you feel sorry for yourself day in and day out. And all you're doing is sitting around under a juniper tree somewhere licking your wounds. Amen. Anybody, anybody fit in that category? Well, let me tell you something. We've all been there. Amen. To one degree or another. But God wants something much better than that for you. Amen. He wants you to be able to give what you've received. The Apostle Paul says, what do you have that you have not received? One more time. What do you have that you did not receive of the Lord? Well, I worked for it. Yes, but God gave you the ability to work. Whatever you want to call it. Whatever you say. God is the giver. He's a good giver. He giveth gifts. It pleases God to be able to give unto us. But then it pleases Him even more for you to be able to receive it in the right manner, in the right attitude. For it doesn't drive you from God. Amen. Some folks can't handle a dollar bill. They can't do it. They make a little, I know of one case where it's not too far from here. Where a man and his wife were in church. They were faithful to the church. They went to church every Sunday. The man started a business. His business began to prosper. First thing you know, he had money in his pocket. He had a bank account. And what did he do? He turned his back on God. Because he was consumed with things. Earthly things. But it wasn't too long after that. Because he had people praying for him. He, he, was, he, he made his mistake by marrying into a godly family. A bunch of people who prayed and called on the Lord. Amen. Amen. If you want to get in trouble, start messing with somebody that prays. <laughs> Amen. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And what happened? He got back in church and got right with God. And he put his money in its rightful place. And he viewed it the way he should have viewed it. It is, it is something, it's simply something that, it's a tool. It's something God gives you. It's like a hammer. The hammer is useless without the hand that can use it. Or an instrument of, of measuring whatever. God has got to be able to give unto you in order for you to receive. So in chapter number 11 and verse number 24. By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. There's a lot of issues covered here in chapter number 11. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of viewpoints. And, and I want to call your attention to this one here. When Moses came of age, he grew up as a child in Pharaoh's home. Pharaoh's daughter raised him, so to speak, but his real mother's the one that raised him. But he grew up in this home. And he was wise in the knowledge of the Egyptians. In other words, he was very well educated for his time. If you don't believe me, check into ancient Egypt. And look at some of the stuff that they made. No question about it. But it didn't come from God. And so Moses came of age. Some of you are about to come of age. Some of you are about to come to the point in your life where God no longer sees you as an innocent child. But he sees you as someone maturing and able to make a choice based on a decision based on truth that has been presented to you whether you're willing to receive it or reject it. You may be there right now. It's different for different people. There's no certain age. This is why the Bible doesn't give you an age. It comes to some earlier than it does to others. But when that does come, you're going to make a decision. Amen. You're going to make a choice. You're going to choose you this day whom you will serve. So the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, in verse number 36, I love this verse. Because in Hebrews chapter number 11 and verse number 36 it says, And others... Had cruel mockings and scourging, J. Moreover, bonds and others. You see, I'm one of the others. Are you one of the others? Amen. You see, your name is not in Hebrews 11. But if you're a believer, you're one of the others. And there are many others. There's a lot of others you've never heard about. We have a lot of Christian celebrities today that everybody's heard about. 
And this is nothing against any Christian celebrity. Some of them didn't choose that. They were just made that. But the bottom line is, God has no celebrities. The bottom line is that if you're a believer, you're part of the faith of Hebrews chapter number 11. Now, don't you notice something about this, if you haven't already. This is important because this leads into the heart of my message this morning. This is important. When you look at the Hebrews chapter 11 and read all of this about all these people, if you've read your Bible, if you've read the scriptures and you've prayed it all over it, you realize something's missing. Something's missing and it's a big deal. It's missing. So what's that? Well, if you notice every one of them, God looks at them in a certain way and he wants to talk about a certain thing. He wants to talk about their faith and their obedience to God. And he uses that as an illustration for you to bless you. But he doesn't say a word about their faults. Ain't there. That's a big deal though. You think he's aware of their faults? He's conscious of them? Why certainly he is. He has no question about it. But you see, there's something going on in Hebrews chapter number 11. It's a little deeper than the surface. You say, what is that? Well, my folks, if I'm put to the test and my faith is put to the test and I fail the test, Satan doesn't get too excited over that. I'm just one of many. I'm just one of the others. I'm just here today and gone tomorrow. You know, that's all we all are if I'm put to the test. But what if God's put to the test? What if there's something running a little deeper here in Hebrews chapter number 11 than us being put to the test? Maybe God's being put to the test. When you read the book of Job, you'll find out that that's exactly what happens in the book of Job. Now, Satan never understood it to be that. Satan thought he could destroy one of God's people. That would be done. That would be it. They, you know, that faith was a joke and, and there's nothing to it. But God put his own character on the line. Yes, he did. He put his own name on the line. And he allowed Satan to do everything Satan could do. Satan threw all of his weapons against him, all his fiery darts. He tried to destroy him from the face of the earth. But he could not deal and understand with the deeper aspect of what's going on here. The Lord said, try me and prove me. Try me. And you ever tried God? Have you ever done what Gideon did? Have you ever crawled off in a corner somewhere and laid your fleece out on the ground and didn't tell a soul? Shut the door, just you and God, and start talking to him about stuff. Well, now, preacher, I don't know if God wants me to do that or not. What are you afraid of? Are you afraid of getting too deep in there with him? Are you afraid of getting too close to him? Don't you, have you got to the point in your Christian life where you enjoy that little bit of distance? You, you know, you, you pray a little bit, you read your Bible a little bit, but... But you really aren't sold out to God. You follow Him afar off. That's what the Bible says. They followed afar off. So put Him to the test. Try me, He says. Prove me. Everyone here in Hebrews chapter number 11 put God to the test. Oh yeah, they were put to the test. But ultimately God's word and God's character is put to the test. Think of that. Every time over and over again the Bible says, For His name's sake. For my name's sake. One time when He said over there in the Old Testament, He said He brought the children of Israel up out of Egypt. And, and, they, and they said to Him, Well, did you bring us up so that we would die, so that we would be destroyed by the enemies? Why did you bring us up? What was the point? What was the purpose? If He had tried to explain it to them, they weren't ready to receive it. He needed a Moses. And once he got a Moses, he got one who was able to talk to face to face. Face to face. Face to face. Not a bad thing. I want you to look at Genesis chapter number 32, verse 28. Look here over here. Now turn with me and let's read it. Genesis 32, verse number 28. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, Jacob, usurper, supplanter, but Israel, Israel, prince and king with God. For as a prince 
Hast thou power with God and with men hast prevailed? God changed his name. And I'm going to show you in a minute how he used that. It's quite a remarkable thing. Look at verse 30 now. And Jacob called the name of place Peniel. For he said, I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. If you look up the root of that Hebrew word, Pena, you'll find out that it means to turn the face. In plain words, Jacob had come before the presence of God and he watched him turn his face. And the more his face lined up with Jacob's face, the more Jacob could see himself for he was looking into a mirror. Man, it's a quiet. You could hear a pen drop in here. Does that speak to you? If you've ever looked into the face of God, for one thing, it's a blessed thing. But it's a mirror. It's a mirror of who you are. And you know it. How many of you know in this house this morning you're not going to flim flam God? Raise your hand. You're not going to hoodoo him. You're not going to lie to him. Beat around the bush. You're not going to get away with it. How many know you'll never get away with a lie to God? Amen. Amen. So what's the problem? <laughs> I mean, even though you know it, you still do it. And, I, and we all do. Peniel. I saw God face to face. Now, you remember Moses saw him face to face? And when Moses saw him face to face, he was on top of the mountain. Moses saw him face to face, and God said, I will speak to you, Moses, like none other. I will speak to you face to face. But here Peniel changed Jacob. Look at chapter number 35, verse 22. Genesis 35, 22. And it came to pass when Israel dwelt in that land. Here we got Israel. God's changed his name now. That Reuben, who is Reuben? He's what? That's exactly right. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, the first firstborn. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah. Reuben is the firstborn, the beginning of Jacob's strength. His posterity passed on down. In plain words, Reuben is bearing the identity of his father, Jacob. Look what he does. Verse number 22. He went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard it. Now look at Israel, look at, look at Reba. Israel heard it. The sons of Jacob were twelve. Look at the wording, look at the wording. It didn't say the sons of Israel were twelve. It said the sons of Jacob were twelve. Notice, Jacob had sons before he became Israel. In other words, the Bible's calling your attention to the fact that Jacob's sons were Jacob's sons before Israel became Israel. In plain words, the Bible's telling you, these are the ones that were born unto you, Jacob. Now look carefully. They're born unto you, and they're the ones who sells their brother into slavery. Yes, from the old man. I want you to look further. Chapter 48, verse number 2. And one told Jacob and said, Behold, thy son Joseph cometh unto thee. And Jacob strengthened himself and sat upon the bed. Did I mess up? How many caught me? What does it say? Israel strengthened himself. Jacob could not strengthen himself, but Israel strengthened himself. In the, the two of you in this house. How's an old, sorry, low-down, stinking dog, and there's not a one of you, if you've got, you got half a heart, if you've got a soul that's still alive, there's not a person in this house that would want somebody to put a huge screen up here and play back everything you ever did before you got saved and let you hear the sound and see, the, see it in living color. <laughs> High definition. Put it up here and let the whole world see what you used to be. Would you want that? Well, ain't nobody in here. You wouldn't. You'd, you'd, be, you'd be running for the wood bushes. You'd knock the door. Open. Get out. Let me out of here. You wouldn't want that. But God knows all about that old man. So what does he do? Well, this is a lie. 
He doesn't take the old man to make a new man. He doesn't need the old man. He doesn't need anything of the old man. No. He makes an entirely new man. From the hand of God. And that makes all the difference. For I have two of me. I have one that was made from that one in heaven. And I have that old sorry low down stinking dog that was born here. And one day, and it probably won't be long, I'll say goodbye to the dog. And I will rise into the heavens. And I'll meet my Lord. When I was in high school, I ran track and played basketball. Didn't play football, ran track. Played basketball. Loved basketball. I was a basketball nut. But I ran track to have something to do. I ran the 220 hurdles, high hurdles, ran the hurdles. I wasn't fast enough for the 100-yard dash, but I was a little faster than most. So we had what's called the, uh, the relay. What was it where you have four of them? They run the race. They, run, they, hand the, they hand the baton. All right. Yeah. Well, let me tell you something. Four of them run. One of them finishes. One of them finishes it. One of them has that baton handed to them. And they've got to cross that finish line. And they've got to give it everything they've got. And sometimes I've seen it in these races, you watch them. Sometimes their team will be ahead, but they're slow and they lose the race. Sometimes their team will be behind and they're fast and they'll win the race. Well, every one of us are in that fourth place one time or another in our life. Every one of us have had that baton handed to us. And we're on the last leg of that race. That's where I am. The baton has been handed to me. And I'm on the last leg of that race. And by the grace of God, until the last breath comes out of this body, I'm going to be in the race. I'm going to finish my race. I'm going to finish my course. Amen. Amen. Yes. I have nowhere to lay down. Nowhere to crawl up in a corner and die. Nowhere to feel sorry for myself. Nowhere to quit God and walk away from it. Nowhere. I will say, as, as the Apostle Paul said, by the grace of God, I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And I don't know how long he's got for me here, but until he gets ready to take me from this world, that is what I intend to do. I hope you have that attitude. I do. I hope you have that attitude that you're going to stick with it till you're finished. I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 41, verse 14. Isaiah 41. 14. Isaiah 41. 14. I thought I had it marked. Let's see. No, I don't. I don't have to find it. Isaiah 41, here we are. Isaiah 41, 14. Fear not, thou worm, Jacob, and you men of Israel. I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. If you read the context of the 41st chapter of Isaiah, you'll read about Israel's enemies. And there were many. And Israel's a small country. Small people. But he said, I'm going to make you like a, like a, like a, what is it called? A scythe? Where you cut the wheat, where you cut it down. He said, I'm going to let you cut them down everywhere. And remember, worm, Jacob, where you came from. And what I'm going to do with you. And I'm going to cut your enemies down. And they're going to be gone. A worm. You know, the Bible says about the Lord Jesus in Psalm 22, I am a worm. Did you notice that? On the cross at Calvary, he said, I am a worm, not a man. Think about that. I want you to view God's view of his people, and I'll come to a close. Look at Numbers 23, verse 18. Numbers 23, 18. Now Israel's coming through the land. King of Moab says you're going to spread all over the place. There's not even be food left to eat. All these people that have come up out of Egypt, if we don't do something, something about them, we're finished. So he gets Balaam, a prophet, 
And he calls on Balaam to curse Israel. Curse them. I want you to curse these people. Let them wipe them from the face of the earth. Now look at this. This is a beautiful thing, folks. Numbers 23, verse 18. He took up his parable and said, Rise up, Balak, and hear. Hearken unto me, thou son of Zippor. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, shall he not make it good? Behold, I have received commandments to bless, and he hath blessed, and I cannot reverse it. He hath not, look at this now, he hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. My. All right, let's set it in context. Here's Israel's enemies. They want to destroy Israel. Empowered by Satan. They want to come against him. Let's take Israel and make that a type of you. You have your enemies that want to destroy you. They want to tear you down. They want to do away with you. All right? Here's what he just said. He said, I don't see any iniquity. What are you talking about? Who are you to charge? These are my people. I love these people. Wait a minute. They're not perfect. Yes, but he's the God of all grace. You see, here's the point. Here's the point about this thing. And the point is that once you become a child of God, a son of God, you are covered by the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has made unto you righteousness. He has made. Rebellion is when you try to exercise your own righteousness. And the world has no say so in it one way or another. You belong to God. Completely belong to Him. Absolute and complete, you belong to the Lord. And the Lord said, Balak through Balaam, I haven't beheld any iniquity in Israel. In other words, there's nothing you can say to me to cause me to destroy my people. These are my people. They'll be my people when the end comes. The scripture says, love covereth a multitude of sins. I want you to look around you. Every person in this house is a sinner. In what sense? 1 John 1. Just read it. Get home. Pray over it. Really, pray over it. But, if you look at each other, pick each other, take each other apart, it's going to be one, it's going to be one unending war of attrition. You're going to you're going to consume each other. There, you're never going to have any power in here. There's never going to be any power of the Spirit in this house. You're going to grieve the Holy Ghost. And temple will become a pharisaical, dead orthodox, nothing. That's what it will become. Well then, preacher, you telling me to condone? No, there's no condoning anything in here. What you're saying is, I know you're not perfect, but I want the best for you. I want you to grow in grace and knowledge in the Lord. I want to extend a hand to help you because I know what I've been through. Maybe I can help you through what you're going through. That's love covering a multitude of sins. And that will win the day. Love never faileth. So, Jacob, thou worm Jacob. Glory to God. Would it make me mad if the Lord said, thou worm Charles Lawson? No, Lord. It would not make me mad. Because I am not what I used to be. I know where he called me from. Father, bless your word. If there's somebody in this house today, they need forgiveness. Satan beat them to death. What a thing he is. He will tempt them to sin. He'll lay before them beauty, pleasure, so-called joy. He'll lay before them all of the riches of the world. And then once they take of it, and it begins to tear them down, then he'll turn right around and condemn them. And condemn them. And condemn them with his ultimate purpose is to destroy them. As a roaring lion, he walketh about seeking who may devour. Swallow in one gulp. Take them down. In Jesus' name. Nobody's looking this morning. 
When anybody raise your hand, don't say, Preacher Lawson, I want you to pray for me because I, I need what you're talking about. God bless you. God bless you back there. Amen. God bless you up here. Got hands up, going up all over the place. God bless you back there and up here on the front. You need it. We all need it. But you may be conscious of your need more now than it normally is. Do you want to do something about it? Why don't you do something about it and walk out that back door this morning with a song in your heart again? Joy in your soul. See what you hadn't seen in a long time. Have power in your life like you hadn't in a long time. Start praying, reading your Bible again. Loved ones are going to watch that. They're going to know it. They're going to see it. Anybody else raise your hand this morning and say, Preacher, pray for me? Well, God bless you back there. Amen. God bless you up here. Anybody else? God bless you here. All right. Father, in Jesus' name, we raise these folk up before thee. Lord, you know I'm not a priest. I'm not between them and you. No, 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 no. They have direct access to the Father, and they don't have to come through me. But, Father, I pray as an intercessor for them. I lift their name up, and I bring them before you. And I pray you'd help them. And I pray for whatever may be holding them back this morning. Just push it out of the way and let them come to you. Let them come and get victory. Let them come get forgiveness. And it may be come and be saved. Lord, I don't know the heart. I don't know everything about all these people, but you do. And I pray for them in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake.